actually developed an online community here. Um, over 1,500 participants in our online events so far. So really, kolakavod to the two of them who work so mm. hard to put in all yes. of this together. So thank you. Um, I'd like to. I'd like to start with uh, a very short description of the organization that's behind uh, today's event and, and the, all the events that we've had so far and the events to come, which you all invited, and that is Telfed. So uh, look at this as the advertisement before the show, right? before we get to the main show where you're going to hear from Nina. So I'm going to just share my, sc my screen and uh, we'll very quickly go through the Telfed presentation. So uh, Telfed is our nickname from Tel Aviv Federation. In 1948, we were in Tel Aviv and we were founded by the South African Zionist Federation to look after the 800 Machal soldiers that came to fight in the War of Independence as volunteers. And they came and brought with them their World War II experience. I too was in Machal, obviously not in 48, but the program still continues until today. And um, our mission is to promote the quality of life of Southern Africans and Australians. And it's nice to have Australians on, on, on the screens today as well. Great to have you joining us. We want to promote that quality of life that only the state of Israel can provide by being in uh, this, the, the land of Israel with a, a Jewish state with the majority of Jews. But specifically, we want to see a participation and contribution of the Olim to Israeli society. We don't uh, want our Olim to remain in a bubble but the amazing uh, values that they bring with them from the diaspora, we want to see that making a contribution to Israeli society. And the last slide relates to the different departments in Telfed. Each uh, little square that you see on the screen is a full-time staff member with a group of volunteers. Obviously, Klita absorption is the heart of Telfed since 1948. We deal with the Olim before they arrive. And that's when really Aviva comes into the picture. We connect the Olim to our 24 regional committees throughout the country. So if somebody knows where they're going to live, they can already start corresponding with uh, our volunteers before they make Aliyah and learn about the place where they're going to go live in. We greet them at the airport when they arrive. And then we're in touch with them regularly during their first year to make sure that their Klita is a smooth one. After the first year, Olim can be in touch with us as often as they like, but we leave it up to them to initiate that contact. You can see uh, last year, we had over 400 Olim from South Africa, close to 200 Olim from Australia. And we've also now voluntarily, that's through Aviva's uh, uh, volunteers from the United Kingdom, to also help with the absorption of Olim from England. Lone soldiers need a lot of help both before the induction, while they're in the army, and specifically when they finish the army to move back into Israeli society. So a special committee, staff members involved with helping the lone soldiers. And Telfed is the only organization that provides rental housing for Olim. We have 105 apartments in Tel Aviv and in Ranana, where Olim can live in those apartments for up to three years, and they pay up to 30% below market rates for their rentals. So it's a really lovely absorption center in Ranana and two in Tel Aviv, 70%, 7-0, 70% of the rental income goes here to help support the needy. We support over 450 needy uh, Olim every month, and the majority of that money comes from the rentals in the building. We have a full-time social worker to provide, provide counseling for those in need. We have uh, 90 events uh, a year. That's uh, about close to two a week with uh, 5,000 participants every year. Now all those events have moved over to an online platform and we invite all of you to continue to join us at all these wonderful online events. If you're not uh, getting our newsletter, please drop a line to Aviva so we can update your details in the database. Over 10,000 families get the newsletter once a month, keeping them up to date about what's happening in Israel, in the South African and Australian community. The Telfed magazine, which is a delight to read, uh, comes out uh, three times a year. Uh, the Hanukkah edition should be on its way to you. And if you're not getting the magazine, then please again update Aviva with your address so we can correct it in the database. And please join our Facebook page, over three and a half thousand people there, and uh, a lot of uh, wonderful information and correspondence on the, on the Facebook page. So please, please go and like that page. Telfit provides over 500 scholarships every year to students. 
And these are students that are pre-Aliyah scholarships and also um, post-Aliyah scholarships. Look, Two and a half million shekels oh. of scholarships uh, every year. Um, please, please be quiet. Um, the, um, sorry about that. <laughs> um, so we have, uh, again, I'm speaking about the scholarships. And um, regarding our volunteers, we spoke about the, the, the volunteers, the 24 regional committees that we have. And also we have volunteers teaching um, English to Olim. That new, here we have Olim from Ethiopia. We have them teaching uh, English to Olim. And the last slide here being uh, employment. We have a full-time employment advisor, which is helping people pre-Aliyah and post-Aliyah, um, helping them getting ready for the workforce and if any of you would like to be mentors, if you feel that you've really done well in your field, then please uh, let Aviva know and you can join our list of mentors who are uh, helping the new Olim enter the workforce. And the last point I'd like to make is if you're looking for an organization to support, certainly you can see that Telfed is, is a wonderful Olay organization. 40% of our budget, we rely on support from uh, our community. So if you're looking for, for an organization to support us towards Hanukkah, that spreads light uh, to so many people, please keep us in mind. And Aviva will post that address on the chat. Thank you very much. And we look forward to a wonderful event together with Benina Todaraba. Everyone, thank you for sharing uh, Telford's activities with us. We're glad to hear them. Uh, in one moment or two, I'm going to hand you over again to Aviva. Normally, I would introduce our guests on our events, but here we have an even special connection that Prim is uh, Aviva's mother-in-law. So a warm welcome to you. Nice to see you and meet you. And uh, then I'm going to hand you over to Aviva. And towards the end again, I hope we will have a chance to chat. Thank you for being with us today. You're on mute. You have to unmute yourself. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. So, Penina Taylor is a Jewish educator, motivational speaker, author, and master mindset coach who works with coaches, speakers, and thought leaders so that they can show up authentically and wholeheartedly for their audiences. Penina is the author of two books, is a podcast host and currently runs a program called Coaching with Courage, which provides a comprehensive support system for coaches, speakers, and thought leaders. Panina has been a counselor, therapist, coach, and coach trainer for over 25 years. Panina made Aliyah in 2006 with her husband and four amazing children. I can attest to that. I married one of them. <laughs> <laughs> and they are all now married with children of their own. Penina and Pinchas, uh, her husband, live in Gush Etzion. Thank you, Penina. Thank you personally. And thank you as a professional for giving us of your time today. And uh, I hand over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Aviva. I tell you, it's, uh, it's always hard when I say that I live in Israel with my four children, because really I live in Israel with my eight children, uh, because all of my the children that married in are just as near and dear to me as if they had come from me myself. So um, it's, you know, just wonderful to have you. And uh, I, I believe that Telfed is very fortunate um, to have you on their staff. Well, I guess I don't have to do much of an introduction since Aviva did such a beautiful introduction for me. Um, welcome to When Going Back Isn't an Option. I'm sure you can't guess why on earth I would use such a title <laughs> for a talk about Aliyah, right? I cannot tell you how many times in the past 14 years I've said the sentence, if all of my children and grandchildren weren't here, I'd consider going back. But they are here and it isn't an option for that and many other reasons. But before I get into the topic, I do want to tell you a little bit about myself. We had this introduction, which was absolutely lovely. Um, I do want to tell you I'm currently working on my third book, which I actually hope to have available as an ebook in the next few weeks. We'll see if it actually happens. But I got the, the reason I mention it is because I got the inspiration for this book while I was standing on the top of Table Mountain on the Cape in South Africa. And um, 
this year, while I've not been able to travel because of Corona, I've used this time to build up my coaching business. But I wanted to specifically mention the inspiration of South Africa, because I guess I kind of consider myself, I don't know if I would say like an adopted South African or simply a South African wannabe or what, but the few times that I traveled to South Africa on speaking tours, I absolutely fell in love with not just the country, but the people and specifically the Jewish community. And so Hashem made sure that I had a South African in my family so I could really feel like I'm, uh, I'm part of the South African community, at least to a small degree. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not originally from there, as you can probably tell by my accent. <laughs> but my husband and I made Aliyah from Baltimore, Maryland, which is in the United States, almost exactly 14 years ago. And at the time, our four children were 18, almost 17, 14, and 13. And our youngest turned 13 years old on the day of our flight. His bar mitzvah was literally three days after we landed. And our 18 year old had come to Israel six months before us to join the Israeli army spurred on by the second Lebanon war, which Baruch Hashem was so short that it was over a few days before his flight, but he still enlisted, he still came and he served as a non-citizen. Our daughter, who was a senior in high school, stayed in Baltimore for an additional five months so that she could graduate with her class. And then she came to Israel right after graduation. And the two younger boys were homeschooled. It's another story all in itself. But my husband, a convert who could barely read Hebrew, was 45 and I was 39. So our Aliyah experience, as you can probably imagine, was totally fraught with all kinds of challenges, literally from the moment we stepped off the plane. In fact, it started snowing on our way to our new apartment. <laughs> but <clears throat> on top of that, we didn't come with a large savings. And it took my husband 18 months to get a full-time job, which was shortened to 80% within a few months because the economy was not doing so well. And it wasn't just that it took 18 months to find a job. After almost a year of experiencing age discrimination, language barriers, Anglo discrimination, he finally decided to retrain in a different but related field. And it was after that that he finally found work. In America, we had a house to sell, but we nearly lost money on it because this was the end of 2006 when the United States economy tanked and house prices plummeted. So we originally thought that we would have enough money to put down a nice chunk of a down payment on a house, like maybe even 50%. But not only did that not happen, the little bit of money that we did come with from the sale of our house had to pay our bills while we were both unemployed for 18 months. So Sal Klita is nice, but it doesn't support a family of six. But even with all of that, we're still here. And there's some things that we've learned along the way that I would like to share with you. But before I do that, I was wondering if I can just get an idea of how many people here are olim, are already in Israel, and how many of you are thinking about making Aliyah. If you can just type into the chat box either Ola or thinking, thinking about it. If you're an Ola, you can include, um, I'm assuming that almost everybody here is from South Africa, so I guess you don't have to, but you can put the year. So if you would just type into the chat box and tell me if you are an Ola or if you are um, about going to make Aliyah so that I have an idea of who our audience is. Okay, making Aliyah, okay, not yet. Ola, <clears throat> Ola, thinking about Aliyah, new Ola, but not from South Africa. Been in Israel since 1969, wow. Okay, Ola, Ola, making Aliyah. So we're about split, I think it looks like, on um, people that are here and people that are coming. So let me start. Melbourne, cool. Pesach, all right. Australia, that's the one English speaking country. Australia and New Zealand are the two English speaking countries that I have not yet visited. I really, really want to visit them when things. I keep saying get back to normal, but people keep reminding me that things will never get back to normal. So when the uh, opportunity arises again to be able to travel. Anyway, okay, so for those of you who <clears throat> um, have been here for a long time, 
there's still a lot of stuff I'm going to share that's that's relevant. And for those of you who have not yet gotten here, um, don't let what I'm going to say scare you off, because I'm talking about the emotional realities um, of being an immigrant and how you experience those emotional <laughs> Yoshi, my son is on. <laughs> no pressure. Um, <clears throat> how you experience those realities are partially up to you. And I highly, 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 highly recommend that um, you have a coach or a therapist or somebody that you can talk to to work through these things. Um, not because I think you're going to be nuts or anything else, but everybody needs somebody that they can talk to and get advice from an outside perspective. But, <clears throat> excuse me, my throat is not cooperating with me. Okay, so great. Today, I'm going to give you some tools that you can use to help you navigate the emotional realities of Aliyah. And I think, okay, so I told you about my family the upper picture was about a year before we made Aliyah, and the lower picture was um, about a year ago because we weren't able to get a family picture this summer with corona and everything. But you can see how much my family has expanded and grown over the years, the 14 years that we've been here in Israel. Nope. And we don't see your screen yet. Ah, thank you for telling me. Okay, hang on one second. Let me share my screen. I did not realize that you couldn't see it. Okay, actually, I think I can just show, share that. All right. Now you can see the screen, yeah? Yes, we see it. Okay, fantastic. All right, so now you see on the picture, the one on the left is my family about a year before we made Aliyah. And the one on my, on my right is our family about a year ago. Um, and so we have grown from just the six of us to, I think we end up being like 25 people. I might be wrong. It might be more than that. We're eight, nine, 10. If you include my parents, 11, 12 plus 11 children. So yeah, 23. All right. <clears throat> so that's us. I want to start by saying that if you are an Ola, the feelings that you are experiencing are common, not just for Olim, but actually for all human beings. Yeah, they're magnified by the pressures and stresses of being an immigrant to a country with a different uh, culture and, and everything else, which we'll get into in a minute. But these feelings are everybody, all human beings experience them. And one of my favorite therapists and a mentor of mine, Marissa Peer, teaches that all human beings share these three categories of feelings. Number one, I'm not enough. Number two, I'm different. And number three, it's not available to me. We all experience those feelings. And then they, of course, grow into, depending on our beliefs and our fears and other things, how we experience them. But when we are experiencing even one of these categories, <clears throat> It can lead us to become depressed and our sense of well being can be out of kilter. And of course, an ole has to function at above normal levels just to be able to keep our heads above water. As I was working on this talk, it suddenly occurred to me that olim usually don't just have to deal with one of these categories. We usually have to deal with all three categories, often at the same time. Now, the first category, I'm not enough, which in the case of being Olim, most often shows up as I don't understand the language and I don't understand how things work around here, right? But I'm not enough is connected to the fear of failure. And it speaks to our need to matter, to be valuable, to have worth. If I'm not enough, then in essence, I'm nothing and my existence is meaningless which you can see, you know, that will have an effect on our ability to function at all. The second category, I'm different. Well, that kind of needs no explanation, right? I mean, all human beings feel like they're different, but Olim even more so because it gets pointed out to us on a regular basis. I remember shortly after arriving in Israel, my husband and I walked up to a kiosk in the central bus station and neither of us had said anything to each other 
We hadn't yet said anything to the guy behind the counter. We just walked up to the kiosk and he greets us first in English. So I turned to him and I said, how did you know I spoke English? And he said, well, you're American, aren't you? And I said, yeah, but how did you know? And he said, oh, I could tell by looking at you. It was at that moment that I realized that I was kind of wearing this invisible sign that every Israeli could read that was flashing American, American, or even in some cases, stupid American, stupid American. <laughs> and even though I no longer feel that I don't belong here, okay, because after 14 years, I don't feel that way anymore, but apparently I am still wearing that sign. <laughs> And while it's usually an, advan an advantage at security checkpoints, in pretty much every other case, it's anything but. We are different, and there's a good chance that if you're over 35, you will always be different if you're over 35 when you arrive, um, no matter how hard you try not to. There are exceptions, but they're rare. And the rest of us, we need to just accept this and going into the situation, understanding that this is a distinct possibility will give you the ability to accept it with a sense of humor and joy instead of dread and embarrassment. Now I just, I make fun of it, you know? I just, I'm there to, you know, yeah, I know, that's me, it's what it is, and then I can move on. By the way, while the first category speaks to our worth, the second category speaks to our ability to experience love and connection, which for most people is their number one need ranking even higher than having their physical needs met. The third category, it's not available to me. That one is a really hard one. It says in Mishlei, which is Proverbs chapter 13, verse 12, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. And honestly, I think that one verse says it all because every single human being has desires and experiences, longing, that's what drives us to better ourselves. And in many ways, it's really the mother of invention, right? If we didn't naturally want more, we'd still be living in the stone ages as a, as a people, as a planet. And it was longing and a desire for a better world that was the catalyst for every single invention that was ever made. And yet, when we hope and try and work towards goals and are continually beaten back every turn, it's really easy to give up and, as the proverb says, kind of have a sick heart. So it isn't available to me speaks to the need for certainty and safety, to having a job, a roof over our head, food to eat. This isn't even about luxuries, right? It's about having your basic needs met, which is not always a concern, but in some cases it is. For us, it was. And it's also important to remember that this sick heart that results from longing isn't only about basic needs being met. It's also about what we're used to having available to us. With work, we can learn to change our expectations and our desires, but it's not always something that we can do overnight like flipping a switch. And oftentimes it's something we need help with, which is why I mentioned at the very beginning the idea of finding a life coach or a therapist or social worker or somebody who can help you work through things as they come up. These emotional realities are the result of some very real, real practical challenges of being an immigrant. Okay, so those of you who have not made Aliyah yet, like I said, don't be scared off, but look at what I'm talking about because it's important to be prepared, although you can never be totally prepared, just warning you. All right, so not speaking the language. This is probably the number one problem for most Olim. If you can learn Hebrew, you will definitely cut, before you come, you will definitely cut down on the amount of issues you have to deal with. Of course, then we have the cultural differences and the things that can result from not understanding the culture of a new country. We have issues of not knowing the laws and thinking that they're the same as the country that, that we came from. Not knowing what benefits are common in work contracts can leave immigrants being taken advantage of, right? Discrimination is real. I frequently, I frequently make reference to something I call the English surcharge. I'm gonna tell you a little story. A few years ago, I was in Jerusalem and I had been walking a lot and I was in a lot of pain that day. 
and there was something going on in the city. I don't remember what it was now. I don't know if it was a demonstration or if there was a, a bomb threat or, or what was going on, but there was something going on and the buses weren't running on the main street on Yafo going to the bus station. So a taxi passed me by and I flagged him and I got into the vehicle. And he turns to me and he says to me, it's going to be a hundred shekels. Now I could see the bus station from where I was. It was just a little bit long to walk, far to walk. Oh, okay, I heard something. <laughs> um, it was a little bit far for me to walk considering how I was feeling, but it was like literally like a 10 shekel, maybe a 15 shekel ride only because there's a minimum, right? Like, so he turns to me and he says to me, it'll be a hundred shekels. And I'm like, this ride shouldn't be more than 15 shekels. He said, well, you know, there's this thing. I said, look, I'm not a tourist, no matter how I sound, I'm an Ola and that's theft. And there's no reason to charge that much. And he said, well, that's what it'll cost. So I got out of the taxi. Now it's possible that my accent made me a target for being taken advantage of. I don't know. I don't think that an Israeli would have been charged that much. There's no way for me to do it. In the end, I walked the whole way, which wasn't that far, but like I said, I wasn't feeling well. I've just found over the years that the fact that it's very clear that I am not a native Israeli has actually cost me sometimes. Uh, okay, next, finding a new job can be a challenge, especially when you have to wait to get your credentials validated by the Ministry of Education or another professional organization. The cost of living in Israel is already difficult enough and people who found themselves to be in the middle class in their country of origin may now find that they're not uh, and mistakes made due to lack of knowledge cost them a lot of money that native citizens just don't have to deal with. And then there's the children. If you have children, you have another host of challenges on top of all of the normal ones. And when parents are spending all of their emotional bandwidth on trying to navigate their everyday lives, things that were simple in their country of origin, like going to the post office, going to the bank, putting gas in the car. I cannot tell you how long it took me to actually figure out how to put, not how to put gas in the car, uh, but how to use the machine at the station right? Because it was all in Hebrew and I couldn't figure out how to use it. And I kept pressing the wrong buttons. And anyway, they now, now they know me, you know, at the gas station. So uh, they often, but things that were simple in our origin of country, when we have to deal with them in our new country, we often don't have the energy left to deal appropriately with children who also need help adjusting. So that is something to keep in mind. While your children will most likely pick up the language easily, those that don't, or those that have a heavy accent, might find themselves being bullied. And what adds fuel to that fire is that children of families from Anglo countries have certain cultural norms that may be different from their peers, and that makes them too different and adds to even more to the likelihood of bullying, which is another thing having to end the cultural difference between if you go to a teacher about bullying in, for example, in America versus in Israel, it's gonna be handled by the teacher very, very differently. And then we have teenagers. Teenagers are teenagers no matter what continent you live on. And navigating the challenges of raising teens maxes out most parents, even if they've never changed countries, languages, or cultures. Add that to the mix and it can be enough to break a person. So those are just a few of the practical challenges. I mean, there's like Ugabs and Ugabs more, um, but those are just a few of the practical challenges that Olim face. And there are so many more, but I don't want to get you down because there is hope. Even if these practical challenges don't go away for you, there are some things that you can do to boost your resilience and get yourself to a place where you can manage them, which is the point of why I'm talking to you today. Okay, so the first tool in this list is your why. With all of the personal development information available at our fingertips now, most people have heard of the idea that if you want to succeed in any goal in life, you have to have a very strong grasp on what your why is. What's your motivation? Because everything you do 
you try to do in life is going to have its struggles and difficulties, right? The bigger the goal, the greater the struggle to achieve it, usually. So knowing your why gives you an anchor and it helps you to bear with the difficulties on the way. So I always advise people, no matter what your station or circumstances, because immigrating to another country with another culture is always hard, even if you're financially privileged and even if you speak the language, I always advise everyone to sit down and write out your why about why you are making Aliyah. Everyone has a reason, a belief about Aliyah. And when I say belief, I'm not talking about religion. You have beliefs that refers to your motivation, your thoughts, your beliefs about the country, about Israel, about your country of origin, about what is here and what isn't there. Okay, you, you have beliefs about Israel and the situation that is driving your desire to move here. What is it? Write it out. I even recommend having children do this because a few months after you land, when something happens that practically brings you to tears, it may not be a few months, it may even be longer or maybe shorter, depending on how long your honeymoon period is, so to speak. Um, something's going to happen that's going to bring you either to tears or nearly to tears. And you will need to pull out this piece of paper and read it and remember why you chose to come here in the first place. And as I said, this is especially important for children. Yeah, children. If you have children who are over bar mitzvah age, but I would say even approaching, like I would say even over 10, right? By the way, this is really, really important. If you have children that are teens or preteens and they don't want to come to Israel, unless there is some very serious mitigating circumstance, don't come now. Please don't bring a teenager kicking and screaming to Israel. You will end up regretting it and you will multiply your changes exponentially. If you want to make Aliyah and your teenager doesn't want to come, and by the way, this is, I, I'm one of these people who believes every Jew belongs in Israel. Every Jew belongs here. But there are three circumstances under which I recommend to not do Aliyah or not do it now. And this is the biggest one. All right. If you want to make Aliyah and your teenager doesn't want to come, bring them on a trip, try to help them fall in love with Israel, have them talk with other teens who are thriving here, see if there's something you can do to help them fall in love with Israel, but please don't come until they are either convinced they want to come or old enough to stay back or out of the house, okay? I know that it's counterintuitive from somebody who believes that all Jews belong in Israel, but this is the one thing that will, it, it will ruin everybody in your family's life, really. So if you have a teenager who does not want to make Aliyah, then try to help them to fall in love with it. If they do, have them do this exercise as well as you, and then put it in a, in a notebook, in a folder, and keep it in a special place where you can find it when you need it. I promise you won't regret it. And if you are already in Israel, okay, maybe except for the person who's been here since 1969, but if you're already in Israel and you never did that, you should do that today. Whether you're still in the honeymoon phase where you just still love everything about the country or and think that you'll never leave that phase or whether you've pretty much hit rock bottom and feel like a prisoner behind bars of your own making, wherever you are at, bring yourself back to where you were when you first decided to make Aliyah and write out your why. Then when things are hard, pull it out and look at it. Did you mean what you said? Are those things still true? If so, how can you reframe your current circumstances so that you can see those current struggles as the sacrifice you have chosen to make to achieve the things you wrote in your essay, right? Being able to reframe the challenges in the context of a choice makes you feel less powerless and more in control, at least something in the situation. Now, I noticed that the chat has disappeared. So hang on one second. Let me just reopen it. Okay, it's still disappeared. Why did it not do that? It's not responding. 
and check. Okay, I don't know where it is. Maybe it's hiding behind my notes. All right, um, next, get rid of expectations. Don't compare yourself to others who may have been here even the same amount of time as you because you don't know what else they are not dealing with. Never compare yourself to anyone else because often when we compare who we are on the inside with what what we see others are on the outside, right? Did you hear that? When we compare ourselves to others, usually we're comparing who we are on the inside to who they are on the outside. And we're not comparing like with like. Then we create this picture in our head of what Olim are supposed to be. And who knows where we got that picture from. And then we measure ourselves by that. Well, she's only been here three years and she's already fluent in Hebrew and she's not having any financial problems and da, 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 da. that's what it looks like we and then so we measure ourselves by whatever that measure is and of course we fall short so we end up reinforcing the beliefs that we're failing or at least not good enough and then that can send us into a mental health tailspin number three one step at a time one task per day now, I know this sounds crazy, but when we first made Aliyah, and those of you who have already made Aliyah, I'm sure you've been told this as well. They told us, don't try to do more than one major task per day. Don't go to more than one um, um, agency, one organization, one bureaucratic whatever per day. And we very quickly realized that this was very wise advice. Now, it seems logical, especially if you don't live in a major city, to cluster tasks so that you don't have to make too many trips into the city, right? You need to go to the absorption ministry and open a bank account and buy a new bed or get a driver's license, whatever. Sounds like the most efficient thing to would be to just plan on doing them all in one day, right? But things don't always go quickly or smoothly. And you will end up burning yourself out because it is emotionally, mentally exhausting to deal in a language that's not your own with a bureaucracy you're not familiar with, to deal with things that you probably would rather not deal with anyway, okay? It's better to make many small trips than to try to get too much done. And they give this advice in the beginning and many of us will take it in the beginning, but then we stop taking that advice. This advice especially goes for later on when you have to deal with bureaucracy and school stuff and big stuff and medical stuff, only plan one emotionally exhausting thing per day. Take, make a special calendar, print off a calendar and like, you know, distribute all the different things that you need to do but only plan on one emotionally exhausting thing per day. Yes, it will take longer to get everything done and dealt with, but you'll have more energy to deal with it with each one. And it will lower the likelihood of you standing on the sidewalk on a busy main street in tears because you have totally had enough. Now, this next one is going to sound a little odd, but make safe decisions. What do I mean by that? Sometimes when we make Aliyah, we come with all these great ideological expectations. We're going to move somewhere without a lot of English speakers, so we'll be forced to learn Hebrew and we'll integrate into the culture, or we're only going to send our child to an Israeli school, or I'm sure that there are a ton more examples you can think of. And those are noble decisions, but they aren't always safe. All right, when we made Aliyah, we moved to a yeshuv that had a couple of dozen e English speaking families, but everyone else was Israeli or French, but that's another story for another time. And we had this noble goal of being in a place where we would be forced to learn Hebrew. But as it turns out, I have, I didn't know, an auditory processing dis disorder. Oh no. And my husband doesn't seem to be able to learn a second language, at least not easily. So the two of us were struggling to communicate. We went to Ulpan and it got us farther along than we were before we went to Ulpan, but not enough to actually speak. 
And so the two of us were struggling to communicate. We had two teenage boys who weren't integrating, at least not that easily, right? Um, especially with the other teens in the yeshuv and they were kind of miserable. I hated my house, I hated my yeshuv, I had no friends, I hated the culture and I was in tears all the time. And then a moment of divine intervention happened. My daughter had already come from the US and my oldest son was getting out of the army and the apartment we were renting was too small for basically four adults and two teenagers. So we looked for something bigger in our yeshuv, but there was nothing bigger available to rent. And remember, we didn't have the money to buy anymore, right? So we started looking elsewhere. And I came across uh, an advertisement somewhere in one of the English, maybe Facebook groups or something, and this house was being advertised for rent. And we went to to look at it. And it was in a city that I wouldn't have thought of moving to, because remember, I moved to the issue that I did because I wanted to be with Hebrew speakers, not in some sort of an American or Anglo bubble. All right. Um, but we liked the house and it was in our budget. So we decided to go ahead and move. Now, I had no idea what a difference it would make moving into a primarily English speaking neighborhood but it was a game changer because I could only handle a certain amount of stress and I was on overload. Moving to this neighborhood meant that I had relief, relief from having no friends, relief from cultural pressures, relief from my children, for my children, not from my children, <laughs> relief for my children who were able to make friends in the neighborhood. So much so that my daughter ended up marrying the son of our neighbor across the street. Well, with the lower stress levels, suddenly living in Israel, in Israel, <laughs> living in Israel didn't feel quite so impossible. Now, on the one hand, living in an Anglo bubble doesn't do anything to help you integrate into the new culture. But on the other hand, if your stress load is too high, it might be the one thing you can do to lessen the amount of stress that you have the emotional bandwidth to deal with and those emotional challenges that come with life, no matter where you live. All right, so it sounds kind of counterintuitive, but sometimes you just have to admit that what you wanted is not necessarily the safe decision. And sometimes, I know we talk in personal growth about not playing it safe because that limits us. But when you're talking about raising a family and trying to acclimate to a new culture, the advice is actually the opposite. It's a good idea, even if it's, it's temporary. Forget about what other people think or how you might be admitting defeat or whatever other story you might find to tell yourself about why this maybe makes you a failure. Make the decisions that are best for your family. And remember, it doesn't have to be permanent. We lived in primarily Anglo neighborhoods for six years before we moved to a town that was anything but Anglo, right? We had trouble communicating frequently. No one in the local bank spoke English, which presented a challenge on a regular basis. But by that point, we had been in the country seven and a half, almost eight years. And we understood so much more about the way things work that we were then able to handle it. Now we live in a different community, which out of the 90 families in our neighborhood section, whatever you want to call it, there are two besides us, two Anglo families, two. So three total out of 90. As it turns out, there are also a lot of Israelis who speak English here, which does make it a little easier, especially like when we get completely stuck. But after 14 years, I can communicate in Hebrew on a very basic level, not very well at, at all. But most importantly, I've become more comfortable with the things, including, including, believe it or not, my ridiculously terrible Hebrew. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm giving up on improving my Hebrew. I'm always trying to learn more. But I've stopped being afraid of making mistakes and my neighbors all appreciate that I'm trying. 
I also understand so much more about Israeli culture than I used to, but I discovered that I'm the type of person who needed to learn these things in small doses instead of all at once being thrown in the deep end, right? Some people have to learn how to put their face in the water before you throw them into the deep end. And I was one of those kinds of people. So now I live in this Israeli community where Everybody speaks Hebrew. The culture is Israeli. In fact, most of the people here are Israeli, and it's okay. And I'm happy where I live because I understand more now, 14 years later. So the point of that was simply that making that safe decision doesn't have to be permanent. You can choose to do it either as a, you know, to have what they call a soft landing, or you can try the hard way, but be willing and open to moving to someplace with, like Ranana or Modi'in or Beit Shemesh. I know there are a lot of South Africans in all three of those places, also Australians and people from the UK. And um, so the thing is, is that after 14 years, not only do I know much more about Israeli culture than I used to, but I've also figured out what I'm willing to change and what I'm not which takes me to the last point. And that is remember that different isn't always, isn't better or worse, it's just different. Different isn't better or worse, it's just different. No matter where you come from, things in Israel will be different from your home country. That's just a fact. I love America. Even though I've been here in Israel for 14 years, I still love many things about America. Don't get me started on politics, okay? I think that there uh, are a lot of things though about the way things are done in America that are better. I think they're better than in Israel. There also happen to be a few things that I think in Israel, that Israel does better than America, but it's not actually better or worse. It's what's comfortable for me. See, different is uncomfortable. One of the things that I teach in my coaching course, and I meant to do a slide, but I didn't, is the unfamiliar, no matter how promising, is far scarier than the familiar, no matter how awful. I'll say it again, because it's like, it's a quotable quote, right? The unfamiliar, no matter how promising, is far scarier than the familiar, no matter how awful. Unfamiliar is scary. We like familiar. We like comfortable, but if you just keep in mind that different is not better or worse, it's just different. You'll be on far better footing to be not just successful in Israel, but to be able to handle all the other stuff that comes your way. Okay, so to recap, five tools to help you navigate all of the other stuff I mentioned, the emotional and practical realities of being an immigrant. Number one, understand and document your why and put it someplace where you can find it when you need it. Two, get rid of expectations. Don't compare yourself to anybody else or what you think you're supposed to be like. Number three, take one step at a time, one task per day. Number four, make safe decisions. Do what's right for you and your family in order to be able to not only be emotionally healthy and to be able to cope with the circumstances. But I remember when somebody was talking about how I had moved to this American community or Anglo community and, and basically deriding me for it. And I said, so do you think it would be better that I go back to America? Or is it better that I live in this American community, but I'm in Eretz Yisrael, right? So just ignore the naysayers. Make the decision that you need to make for your own mental health and ability to thrive in this country. And five, remember that different isn't better or worse. It's just different and that's okay meaning you can prefer things from your other country, but if you can put it in your original country, but if you can put it in perspective, it's just different. I found that a lot of times when I am able to tell myself it's not better or worse, it's just different. You know, 
in my culture, this thing that this person just did is rude, but in their culture, it's not rude. And when I can stop and actually say things like that to myself, I can say, okay, fine. I'm not going to do that because to me it is rude. You know, I'm, I'm going to choose to change here, but not change there. This is something I can't align. I can't step over. But to recognize that for them, they weren't being rude. They were just being themselves. It's a cultural norm. Helps me to be less offended and less angry. Because for a long time, I was really angry that everybody kept touching me. Now, I don't mean touching like, you know, but Israelis have a much smaller personal bubble than Americans do. I would tend to think that British and South African have an even bigger personal bubble than Americans, but it's just a guess, right? We don't like people being in our face and in our space. But in Israel, which is a Middle Eastern country, um, where the personal bubble is very, very small, mostly because people ha- are used to having to stand in line and push to get where they need to. And people would be bumping into me all the time. And I remember when I was standing in line to get into the uh, bus station. So, you know, somebody would be bumping me from behind and I would just like, you know, kind of like surreptitiously elbow them in the stomach so that they would get the hint to give me some space. But it used to make me really angry until I stopped and said, okay, they have a different concept of personal space. I still don't like it, but at least it doesn't make me angry anymore, okay? So just remember, different isn't better or worse, it's just different. Now, before I take questions, I want to, first of all, thank you for being here with me today. Let me just go to the last slide. And to let you know, that I am a coach and I do take private coaching clients and I have a discounted rate for those who live in Israel or and South Africa because of the difference in economies. Um, but it is private coaching. And if you'd like more information on working with me, you can email me at panina at paninataylor.com. And I'm on all of the social media. And right now my personal profile is full for Facebook, but you can always follow me and you can like my business pro page so you can keep up. I post everything uh, uh, public. So um, you'll still be able to interact with me and everything like that. Okay. Um, so since I don't know where the chat Thank you so much. The chat is here. There are a few uh, questions Ah. in the chat. Um, Okay, great. Somebody, when you were referring to the time you were here, and somebody said they still, if you'd like to read it yourself, or would you like me to read it? I'm sorry, um, say that again. It's to, uh, it says here, I still get the, do you see the chat? still get, right. Okay, I can read it. I still get, I still get that after almost 14 years. Typically, they come up to me and start talking in English, right? When I ask, how, how do you know, they look at you and speak English, even though I'm fairly proficient in Hebrew, as I was even when I made Aliyah. Yeah, um, not all of my children get that. But if you have, even if you're fluent, if you have even a hint of English uh, accent, they'll frequently, I think it's just because they want to practice their English, to be honest with you. I don't think that it's, it's a deri- deriding or whatever. Um, Alan messaged me and reminded me of a story that I, yeah, because we used to be neighbors. So um, there is a, a story, it was Yom Kippur. And the community that we lived in, you bought tickets to your, to, to, to see, to, uh, to shul uh, for Shabbat, right? So um, it was the last, it was Ni'ila, the last service of the day. And I had had five seats that I had purchased. Me, my mother, my sister, my daughter, and two students that were with us, I think it was. And we came in and there were these people who were sitting in, five lovely ladies sitting in our five seats. And so I very, you know, proudly turned to the girls and I say, Zuz bevakasha, you know, move please. Yesh li Chamesh kosot. Now, a kos is a cup and a chair is a kise. But instead of saying chairs, I said cups. So I'm telling these people, please move. We have five cups. Yesh lanu chamesh kosot. Yesh lanu chamesh kosot. And they're looking at me like I'm a lunatic. And they moved, but I think it was because they were afraid of catching whatever it was that I had instead of actually understanding what I meant. 
All right, another question. How do you stop comparing your new life to what you had before? That is a really, really good question. There are a lot of things that you can do to reframe, but I think one of the biggest things, and I mentioned this in the talk, is to remind yourself that you chose to make the sacrifice of what you had before in order to have what you have here. So like, for example, I'll give you an example. It's, you know, um, I don't know Celsius so well, I still haven't gotten used to it. Like it's 45 degrees outside, right? And um, you're like, you're broiling and you're miserable because you're super hot. And at least I don't know about, you know, different areas of South Africa, but in America, um, in America, it doesn't get that hot. Um, and so what I decided to do was to reframe it, to think of myself as if, like, if I were going on safari in Africa, I wouldn't complain about the heat because that's part of the ambiance, you know, that's part of the experience, right? So I try to remind myself, I'm visiting the Middle East. I'm in the Middle East. This is part of the experience. This is part of the ambiance. This is, and to try to change my focus from what's making me miserable because I'm comparing it to what I had and instead focusing on why I chose to be here and what this experience is like. And, you know, it's really interesting. There's a principle that I teach in my coaching and in my coaching course that I give that the brain actually has a very difficult time distinguishing between what you focus on and what you really experience. Uh, I have a whole story about a study that was done and it's like, you can actually improve 80% of what you can improve by physically doing something just by focusing on it. So that goes both directions. The more you focus on what you've left behind, the more you will want it and the more miserable you will be. And the more you focus on the good things that are here, on why you chose to come, on the little things about Israel, like for example, for me, uh, one, there's a lot of things having to do with hospitality and the way people interact and treat each other in some aspects that are actually much better than American uh, culture. So if I can focus on those things, right, instead of focusing on how expensive my housing is, I focus on how cheap my vegetables are, whatever, just a shift, just a slight shift in changing what you focus on will actually change how you feel about your circumstances. So make a list, write a list of all of the good things about Israel. Even if the biggest thing is, I can find stuff for Hanukkah to decorate my house or like, right? There are so many little things about Israel, about living in a country that is mostly Jews, that is just so different from living in a country that is not. And, um, so let's see, um, okay, how do you stop comparing, right? It's, okay, Hannah is interested in those Telfed, Telfed apartments in Renana, so you'll wanna contact her about that. that. She can apply to the Telfed. Um, okay, great. Maybe everybody would like to be unmuted or unmute yourselves yep. and personally ask the question. I think that's a lot more enjoyable. I think you're right. That sounds good. So is Please anybody want to start that. off? Otherwise I want to just share one thing about becoming Israeli. Anybody hi. got a question? Yeah, so hi, good morning. Uh, can anybody Hello. hear me? Hi, Stan Rubin. Uh, Hello, Deron, Stan, Deron, welcome. Deron Klein. Sorry, my name is Stan Rubin. Um, made Aliyah 18 months ago. Deron Klein would be familiar with me. Welcome. Uh, but I was a South African and then I went to London for 18 years and uh, now made Aliyah 18 months ago. I just want to add, was really a great talk. I just want to maybe add something that people should think about now uh, because the situation is different. So being a new Aliyah, a new Ole in these times, you've got all the challenges that you have that it'd be nicely laid out for you in the talk, but you've got one added challenge you don't have the op same opportunity to experience the highs that you would normally experience as a new Ole because of the lockdown corona situation. Right. So, so with all the difficulties, right. you have to realize that you're going to only, so you almost have the bad and you can't get all the good. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Making the points that Panina made even more important to bear in mind. 
Okay, so you've got to, you know, so make those safe choices to guys coming and do so. It's just something to bear in mind because it's not only hard for us as New Olim, it is hard for Israelis. They're feeling isolated. They're feeling alone. They're feeling worried. They don't know about finances. They worry about schooling. You know, things are not working. So you've got all this other thing. So, so just bear that in mind when you're thinking about it. Um, and thank you for the talk. Thank you. That is a very, very, very important point that you made that I really forgot to touch on and I should have. And one of the things that you need to do is make sure that you take the time to, even if we're on lockdown, to go out into your yard, to your garden. Uh, yesterday I had two ladies because they know most of the people in my community are not particularly careful regarding Corona and my husband and I need to be very careful. So um, they know that we're in many ways even more isolated than many of them are. And so a couple of ladies stopped by yesterday and they stood in the yard, in the garden, and we had a socially distanced conversation and we connected and it was really lovely. So that's also uh, something that you need to make sure that you do in these times where it is difficult and we are spending, if you spend a lot of time by yourself, you're going to get into your own head an awful lot. And you need to make sure that you make opportunities to get out of your head, not just out of your house, but out of your head too. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Would anybody else like to ask a question? Okay. Uh, I'm one on the here. <laughs> yeah, so just, um, I mean, uh, Panina and, and, uh, Pinchas, Lori and I know each other a long time. Going back to Nofi Viv, that uh, Anglo community uh, that she moved to, and that uh, it just reminded me of that fun, funny story. And, and I believe those five other women that had her their seats were Ethiopians, because <laughs> we live in the community right next to us was Ethiopian. So I, I doubt that they even yeah. understood English at all. So <laughs> maybe yeah. English speakers might have understood that. But you no, know, this is, I think th these are some of the things that happen here. I mean, I get this, I, 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 uh, Send a chat to Panina about also. I still get that people walk up to me, start talking to me in English, you know. But and I speak pretty good Hebrew, <laughs> but I I, I can I don't care. I let it slide. And um, you know there have been challenges. I know uh, Laurie and I uh, have our uh, middle son is now 39 years old and he was born preemie three months and spent 15 months in the hospital and uh, then came home with nurses and oxygen and. Uh, he never met his milestones. And uh, before we can make Aliyah, we found this wonderful place in Beit Shemesh. And that's why we decided to move into Beit Shemesh, uh, where it's it's called a hostel, but in America it was called the group residence. And, you know, it's we've had 39 years of ups and downs. I mean, he's pretty good, but he can't take care of himself. And so, you know, try to look at things and to be mentally tough and, and get past a lot of the negative. And we have had I'm negative, but there's a lot, a lot of positive things, and I really wanted to uh, listen to Panina, even though I don't know if you told me anything new, but it was always good to refresh my memory in here and, and get re-motivated about a lot of things, and so I'm just glad uh, that uh, you you found yourself. I mean, Panina has an incredible story, and her parents do too. Uh, you know, we were very friendly with her, her mother and her late father, and uh, we haven't gotten a chance yet to meet her, her new stepfather, but we've heard a lot of good things about him and that he has a sense of humor like mine, but I won't hold that against him. <laughs> so, uh, uh, mazel tov, uh, Nina, for a successful aliyah. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any other questions or statements? Well, I just want to share one thing. I've been here for many years, at least 30 years and more. And uh, when I used to go back to South Africa and visit my parents and go with my family, we would go to the supermarket and we know what the Israelis are like. We always want to taste the peach before we've eaten it. <laughs> so my mother would always say, oh, here come the Israelis. So 15 years ago, my parents made Aliyah and uh, they have had a very, very nice Aliyah. It hasn't always been easy. But if you go with my mother to the supermarket today, the first thing she does before she buys the peaches, opens it up and tastes it. So that's it. Here come the Israelis. So really, thank you so much for sharing your experience. I I'm glad that you have good experiences now. And uh, if anybody does want to make Aliyah, please uh, be in touch with the Telford before you do so, and they will give you all the advice you need.
I think that uh, if anybody wants to ask a question, your last opportunity while Pamina is still here with us. Yes, I see Donna. Donna Arden has a question. Thank you. Yes. Is it something we need to read, Aviva? Donna? Donna, are you, are you on? Is your microphone on? Yes, can you hear me? Okay, yes, Donna. Turn up your sound. Um, I want to, I've watched so, so much and uh, I always have to ask the same question, but first I just want to say, uh, Panina, you, you mentioned the, to write a note on why the reason for making Aliyah off. I um, decided uh, two years ago to, to minimize my life and my children are all over 20. None of them are interested in making Aliyah. They're happy, they're successful in South Africa. I love Cape Town. I think it's the most beautiful city in the world. And I haven't traveled the world, but I've seen a lot. And it really is. But my three, can you hear me properly? Yeah. My three reasons, my, my very two valid reasons for making Aliyah are one, I worked in Tel Aviv last year for two and a half months. I was very lucky to get the position. And it was absolutely incredible. And I wanted to live like an Israeli. I didn't want to live like uh, a foreigner or a tourist. And I did. So I walked. Um, my Hebrew is, I was a kindavik. My Hebrew is terrible. And because I'm embarrassed in my, in my accent to speak Hebrew, I never did. So I made sure that wherever I went, I behaved like an Israeli. And um, I had uh, the most incredible, um, my falafel man on the side, when I would finish work, I'd go to the beach, I'd walk to the beach mm -hmm. um, for three blocks. And I, I don't, I'm a, I'm a vegetarian and I don't eat whatever. And I said to him, just give me four falafel balls in a packet. No, I don't do that. And I said, yes, you do. Because if you, you do it once, do it for me once. It's not so bad. I don't need anything else, just the packet. And he tried to, you know, and I said to him, just do it once, please. For two and a half months, every Friday before I walked, I would go and get my falafel balls happily. And I realized every shopping mall that I went to, every market that I went to, I found somebody who was who was friendly enough and warm enough to correspond with me in English, and they were, yeah. and, and it, it was just so. And then I went to India for six months to teach English, and then I came home oh. to lockdown, and um, lost my job because the company closed. I'm in wellness. I'm a cranial sacral therapist. So, I during lockdown, I understood something. It, it gave me a lot of value. Um, and I don't know who else is here. I think there's quite a few South Africans here. That I grew up in a generation of freedom. It doesn't matter what the politics were and weren't involved. I grew up as a child in when you could walk to the beach, when you could take a bus freely, when you could do the things. And freedom was something um, we all took for granted. Now we don't. It, it doesn't exist in in South Africa. So I stay two kilometres from the beach. If I'm at home by five o'clock or indoors by whatever it is, there's no way I can go out alone as I did in Tel Aviv at 2 a.m. in the morning and walk to the beach or walk on my own, walk into a pub on my own and not be harassed or, you know. Um, and that was my biggest thing. But during these months, I've, I've realized that that, even in India, I walked 20 kilometers a day. Nobody came because I was not harassed ever. Because wow. I decided that Israel was like my army to, for India, you know, prepared me, Israel prepared me for India. And I became, um, and I understood something about freedom. I don't have it in this country anymore, especially in Cape Town. I can never walk, I can never, I can never, um, mm. I don't have the privilege of admiring, yeah. enjoying and having this, this gorgeous city in abundance because most of it is after sunset between dusk and dawn. And I can't, as, as, a, as a woman, I can't do that on my own, even in a group, you know, hiking, all the beautiful things. So that was, that was number one. And the second one was that I um, spent time in Alas because I have childhood friends. I have childhood friends that I grew up with who have been in Alas for 30 years, over 30 years. Um, and I've decided on well, What's she doing? Because... <laughs> Sorry. I've decided to go live in Alas and settle in because that's what I need. I need support. I need my extended family. My family are all in South Africa, Australia. My children aren't interested. My niece lives in Tel Aviv. And for me, I want to, you know, I want to start a life um, where, 
where I, you know, my life, not, if you understand what I'm saying, a home, a life, yeah. where there's support. And if I'm going to do it in Israel, if I'm going to do it anywhere, it's going to be in Israel. And because I, I, I was privileged to have this experience, and to have this lockdown, whatever it's meant for anybody, um, it hasn't been person, easy, yeah. I know. It's given me the complete mm -hmm. focus that those are the two main reasons why I want to come live in Israel. And another thing as well is that when I do, um, I'm satisfied to know that I, will, I probably won't for a long time get to work in what my career is. And I will take, I will work whatever job, you know, I to start off with. As I've heard so many people say, I'm not... I'm not, um, I'm humbled. I'm not in any way worried about taking a job to cover my taxes, my water, my life, my rent, my food. To have that freedom, to have that feeling, that, that, that feeling. Fantastic. Definitely write that down. And um, just one thing that I would like to share with you on, on that, and this is really important. If you are making Aliyah as a single person, even as a couple, if you have no children, whatever, you have no other, if you don't have any family in Israel, make yourself a family, adopt a family. If you're older, adopt a younger family to be a parent or grandparent too. Um, if you're younger, find an older family to, to attach yourself to. But family is one of the vital things that will make the difference between a good aliyah and and a not so easy one and so make one if you don't have if you don't have family here already make family thank you Nina. thank you thank you so much my pleasure one more yes donna you can definitely join the barbecue at my house and there's a line of people waiting <laughs> yes. this one yeah I just want to ask about, please, can you mention Ayla? Everybody talks about Renana, Besheva, you know, uh, uh, Natanya, I have, uh, but I, nobody ever mentions about making Aliyah to Eilat. I didn't know that there was a large Anglo community in Eilat. There is. Wow. There, there, there is, it's not large, there is a community in, uh, in Eilat. I'm sure Abuba oh. can share with you one or two people that you can correspond with and uh, ask them questions on a personal basis. I'm sure they would be happy to, to help. So if you can do that, Aviva, it will be wonderful. Thank you again so much for joining us, everybody. What I do want to uh, invite you and remind you that we have a fantastic event on tomorrow um, with um, uh, Rudy Rochman. He's a really well-known activist, Israeli activist, blogger, and social media influencer. So me... Please, Abel, please join us tomorrow evening at 8 o'clock for Rudy Wachman. We will also be going to Haifa on the 1st of December in the vision of uh, Herzl with the Ben-Gurion Heritage Center at 11 o'clock on uh, Tuesday. So please join us as well. If anybody would like to ask more about the events or join one of the events as a presenter, please be in touch with Aviva. And thank you all for joining us today. And uh, all the best to you all. Thank you, Penina, so much for your talk and your encouragement. And we look forward to the next time. My pleasure. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thank you, Penina. Thank, Thank, Thank you, Aviva and Teddy. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a great, Have a great day. day, everyone. Bye, everybody.